All right, folks, it looks like the participant number has stopped climbing, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first up is just a quick announcement. We're going to move to biweekly meetings going forward, um, so that should free up a little bit of time on everybody's calendar. So the next meeting will be week after next, and I will put that up at the end. Um, first up, we have uh, Rule 909J, Produced Water Quality Analysis um, by Peter Gintadis. And I hope I said that right, Peter. And I will put that up in just a moment. Hmm, the slideshow is not working. Give me just a moment to figure out why. That's my only one. Okay, there we go. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Uh, this is Peter Gintadis. I'm an environmental protection specialist with the commission. And we talk about a new rule today that had not been, there is no previous uh, version of this. It's a new rule and uh, 909J, and it requires that produce water going to pits be sampled. Uh, from each well uh, that pr produces to a permitted pit. Anyway, can you go on to the next slide, please? Okay, we'll see here that starting in January when the rules went into effect, uh, operators have a year to sample water, produce water from each pit, uh, each well going to a pit that were constructed before January 15th, 2021, and it would also apply to new pits going forward if there are any. Um, and the initial sampling has to be conducted in the first year and then submitted to this COGCC database no later than the middle of July of 2022. And that was just to give a little bit of leeway and if there's uh, issues with getting it into the database. And we'll talk about how to get it into the database um, in the next slide. And if the pit is gonna be closed or the wells that go to a pit are gonna be plugged in the next year, they also need to be sampled before the pit closure or the well plugging for wells that go to a pit. Then in future years, the rule also requires that there'll be subsequent samples. And we'll talk a little bit about what the, the schedule of that is. Um, and also the rule provides that if we have reason, the commission has reason to believe there needs to be a new sample taken because of perceived changes in the water quality that we can require that, or we can require more frequent or additional sampling if there are reasons to do that, if there are spill or release of something that outside the list um, that's provided in the rule. Next slide, please. And we'll talk first really about how to get the data in because that seems to cause a lot of troubles uh, from groundwater sampling as well. And it's pretty straightforward. The form 43 is how this will be done. Um, it's already in existence. It is in the process of being revised to better handle this, but the guidance that is there gives you ideas of how to get the data in, uh, what the EDD requirements are, the electronic data deliverable, the lab needs to be able to provide that uh, so that the data can go into the database seamlessly. And those, there are links there to uh, the current help files for the VDD and also how to use the Form 443. Next slide. Okay, there's some differences in sampling requirements for line pits versus online pits. Uh, the subsequent sampling, particularly, there's one required subsequent sampling for sure at a time between 33 and 39 months after the initial sample. And Again, that would all be uh, submitted within three months of sample collection to the, by Form 43. Online pits, which the next slide, please. 
the online pit subsequent sampling is on an annual basis. Um, that was a nice line pit in Los Animas County on the first slide there. This is also a, an unlined pit in Los Animas County. Um, I spent a lot of time down there for working for the commission. And I've seen a lot of pits of different sizes, shapes. This is a multi-well, very large pit that's online. And all the wells that flow there need to be sampled on an annual basis after the initial sampling and analysis. And again, submitted by Form 43. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that the commission was particularly interested in was multi-well pits at um, centralized DNP waste management facilities. This is one near Parachute, a centralized DNP waste management facility with a, a set of line pits that are used to treat and then reuse recycle water. And when there are large pits or multi-well pits, the rule says that operators can request a sample from representative wells in the same formation uh, or commingled, whatever might be the case. And you need to do that by a form four submitted for the pit. And you can tell us your plans ahead of time. And it does have to be approved after review by the staff. And the rule says in the statement of basis and purpose that that data has to demonstrate that you know, what you're proposing is representative of the formation or commingled formations in a discrete area within the same field or unit. That shouldn't really pose a problem. Most of you know, you know you're bringing water into a pit from a very a certain area, not from all over the state or whatever. It's coming from your one operator's area and then uh, you can propose a, how you'll get us to understand what representative water going to the pit is. Next slide, please. Okay, sample collection. We, in the guidance document, we've talked about how many places where, some places where samples might be collected. If a, if a well like CBM well sometimes produce water right out of the well without going through a separator, that's a great place to sample. Um, otherwise, uh, if a, one well goes to one separator, sample at the separator, the water right after separation. And if there are multiple wells going to a single separator, as we see up in the Northeast and in some other parts of the state and then to a pit, you can, collect a commingled sample at the separator or the shared equipment, but upstream of the pit. And if no other produced water sampling options are available, you could collect from the, the pipe going into the pit. In no cases are sampling of the standing or stagnant water in the pit that's not representative of what's coming out of the ground. The volatiles may have gone away. This data will also be used in estimating volatile discharges from pits. So we need to know what's in the water and it coming into the pit, not after it sat there for a while. Okay, on to the next slide, please. Okay, there's a list in the rule. I didn't repeat it here. It's in the guidance as well. Um, it's basically the rule, the 615 set of indicator analytes. Uh, also added our two radium uh, isotopes and total suspended solids at the uh, request of CDPHE and to better align so that the data will have a little more data on naturally occurring radioactive materials in produced water going to pits. And they will too. Um, analytical techniques must be capable of getting down to the groundwater standard type of levels not just uh, analyzing it, you know, if, if you report an ND for benzene at a thousand micrograms per liter, the groundwater standard is five. That really doesn't help us understand whether an online pit or a pit could be a source of uh, problems in local groundwater. So there is a table in the guidance that shows some Reg 41 uh, standards for those which there are thresholds in that list. And we understand that if there are benzene is present and it's reported a thousand, that's a thousand. If it still is acceptable, it's just the not detects being reported way above the groundwater standards is a problem. 
and we may require resampling and reanalysis if we get data like that. And we may request it to be run by a different process too at a, at, to get a more sensitive uh, result. Okay, on to the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, we also can ask for additional constituents in certain cases, uh, things that are in Reg 41 that aren't in that table. Um, and there are certainly the table one of the guidance documents gives um, all of the, the compounds and, and the limits. We are working on a model sampling and analysis plan for this. So go into a little more detail on what types of methods are used. It's generally going to be SW846 methods. The RAD met, uh, ones may be somewhat different than that. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, one of the things that's in the guidance is to inspect the, the pit at the time of sampling the wells that go there. I put up a map of, this is pits in Los Animas County, basically. Uh, there's three colors on there, white boxes, green and dark green. Um, one of the things that hasn't always kept up in the database is the status of pits. The dark green pits indicate pits that are closed in our database. The white ones indicate pits that we don't know the status of. And one of the things that's in rule 909A, which would be, it would help you to do this is to actually provide uh, latitude and longitude of the pit so we know exactly where it is because old pits didn't really get in with latitude and longitudes very accurately. In the 1990s, they often came in as a, simply a quarter section or a quarter quarter section with no white long. So, there are places in the state where pits just show up at corners of sections, not because they're really there. And we need to better do that. And Rule 909A required that. So I think that's it. And we'll deal with questions later on. Great, thanks, Peter. And um, as Peter said, if you have any questions about um, his presentation, please chat them in and we'll get to them all at the um, end of our agenda. And Hannah, are you able to pull up my presentation or you don't have it? And you're muted. If you want to chat to me, Hannah, I can pull it up and share from here if you give me the uh, share screen abilities. That's the one. All right, thanks, Hannah. Um, I'm Greg Duranlo, Environmental Manager, and today I'll be talking briefly about uh, Rule 411, um, which is the Public Water System Protection Rules uh, adapted from former Rule 317B. Um, this is gonna be a pretty uh, high-level overview of some things. Um, and at the end, I would really like to solicit not just questions, but feedback on what the regulated community really needs from us in order to effectively uh, implement this. So um, as, as, you're, as I'm going through this, think of um, you know, sort of what specifically um, you really need from us, CDPHE, Division of Water Resources, um, to make sure that we're all uh, doing our part to protect these um, valuable resources. So uh, next slide, please, Anna. First, I'm gonna walk through a few rule reminders. Um, I'm gonna go through the map layers that we currently have. Um, give some information about uh, public water system contacts. 
talk a little bit of specifics about the type three and uh, groundwater under direct influence of surface water, um, public water system supply wells, and then um, we'll move on to feedback and questions. So uh, next slide, please. As far as the rule reminders go, um, so rule 411A is very similar to former rule 317B. Um, it, and it is related to the public water system um, surface water intakes. Rule 411A applies to new and existing wells within a half mile of surface water um, upstream from a PWS surface water intake. And so that's rule uh, 411A4 is the requirement to have a uh, emergency response spill plan for your locations if they are within a half a mile of surface water that is within 15 stream miles upstream of the intake. And if you'll recall, and I'll show in a minute, the um, 317B and 411 classified uh, water segments are five stream miles upstream from the intake. So we are talking about the, the area, um, uh, the reach of a stream, another 10 miles upstream from that for that uh, emergency response and uh, spill notification requirement. Um, rule 411B is the provisions for the PWS groundwater intakes. Um, and so those are the groundwater under direct influence of surface water and type three uh, aquifer uh, PWS wells. Um, these rules are prospective. They do not apply to existing oil and gas operations. They apply to permitting new oil and gas uh, operations. And um, they provide you know, similar buffer zone protections to the rule 411A surface water um, protections and uh, significantly, they permitting within these areas or, or close to these wells uh, requires consultation with the PWS during the permitting process. So spill and release notifications, these requirements re apply to new and existing uh, operations. So they're covered in both 411A and 411B. So they apply to both the surface water intakes and the uh, groundwater intakes, the uh, Goody and, and type three aquifer wells. Uh, so if you have an operation within a buffer zone and you have a spill at your site, you are required to notify the downstream or nearby um, PWS uh, administrator. Um, next slide, please, Hannah. So going into the map layers, this is just uh, reminding most of you of what you already know is there. Um, so if you, if you zoom in on our maps, um, the 317B layers automatically turn on. The 317B layers are the are you know essentially remnant layers from our former rulemaking. They are still um, correct, and I'll I'll talk about this in a little bit um, with respect to the half mile buffer. Um, so these give you not only the classified water segment along the stream path, but also the half mile buffer out. The internal and intermediate buffers have been expanded. We simply don't have the GIS up yet. So that will need to be field verified in terms of which layer with or which buffer within the um, within proximity to a classified layer uh, your location is, is proposed. Um, additionally, when you do zoom in the um, Brighton uh, commission order 1-189 layer automatically turns on. Um, obviously, that's only in the vicinity of, of Brighton. Um, these layers are all nested under the water resources and DWR 
uh, CDPHE layers. There's additional um, information in that as well. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. And so the draft SB 19181 Rule 411 layers is um, now the layer to use for um, the PWS uh, uh, Goody wells and type three aquifer wells. This does need to be manually turned on. And when, it, when you turn it on, you see a polygon um, consisting of quarter quarter sections that are highlighted around a, um, in the vicinity of each PWS well. These are not designed to be representative of the concentric layers. These are simply designed to um, give you an awareness that there is a PWS well in that area and that you need to do additional research to identify the well, identify the PWS administrator, and then take appropriate, um, appropriate measures. Next slide, please, Anna. Um, so just to make sure you all know, the contacts are shown for the 317B or surface water layers. Um, and just by clicking on that layer um, and then holding your mouse, hovering your mouse over the, the, um, over the highlighted uh, 317B area, and I'm gonna keep using that even though it's, it's artificial at this point, um, the, that will uh, give you the map tip flyout that gives you the contact information. So in this case, it's the city of Rifle and the phone numbers there. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Hannah. So a couple other bits of information about these map layers. Um, no actual PWS intakes are shown or highlighted on our maps. Certainly, um, they, you know, you would be able to infer where they might be um, based on the downstream end of those surface water layers, classified water segments, or, you know, looking at the DWR well um, list for the, uh, for the Goody and type three layers, but we have not highlighted the wells or highlighted the uh, surface water intakes. Um, 317B uh, surface classified water segments, they are accurate. Um, the classified water segments remain accurate from rule 317B um, and the external buffer, as I said, is the same. The internal buffers will need to be field verified and I, there may be additional surface water intakes that we don't have included on our current map layer. Um, but for now, this is the best information that we have and we are making it available on our maps. You can certainly reach out to um, the drinking water unit at um, CDPHE and work with them if you think that there may be a layer that we, or a PWS intake that we don't have mapped. Um, the draft SB 19181 rule 411 layer is usable. Um, and we are currently in conversations between COGCC or among COGCC, CDPHE, and DWR to um, just update those and make sure that we do have um, all of the, the information sort of finalized for that layer. Um, that was the layer that was put together um, for the rulemaking. And at this point, it's, you know, it is the best available data um, from our perspective. But again, if you think that you may be in close proximity to a, um, a Goody or type three uh, PWS well that, that is not mapped, you can certainly reach out to us and reach out to uh, CDPHE um, on that. Next slide, please, Hannah. So as far as the contacts, I mentioned that you can use the um, COGCC GIS online interactive map for those uh, PWS surface water intakes. Um, and then you can use this link to um, go to CDPHE's uh, drinking water information page. And then down under online information under the acronym list is a um, searchable uh, database of PWS information that includes all the, the contact um, information for each PWS. And next slide, please, Hannah. So, 
this is just sort of an example of how to use the um, the type three or goody well layers. Um, so here you can see a, a small white X where let's say an operator has proposed an oil and gas location in the northeast section of the south northeast quarter of the southeast quarter of section 22. Um, they're very close to a little blue dot that represents a DWR mapped water well. Um, and that well is private and belongs to the surface owner. So they worked out an agreement perhaps with the surface owner to make sure that they were protecting that well. Um, we are within the polygon of a, um, of a type three, uh, excuse me, this is the blue is a goody. Um, uh, PWS well. And so you kind of look towards the center of that polygon and you can see there are three wells clustered in the northwest of the northwest of, um, of section 22, excuse me, 23. I think I've reversed my sections there. Um, so northwest of the northwest of section 23. And um, so you'd, you'd presume that one of those might be, one or more of those might be the well upon which this polygon is mapped. Um, and looking at those wells, you know, clicking on those wells and going to the DWR information for that, you see that they belong to the TP Bible camp. And presumably then those are in fact the, the PWS wells. So next slide, please, Hannah. Zooming in on those wells a little closer, um, you would first verify the well status. So um, I believe one of those wells is, is no longer active and was replaced by another well. And then, and then the third well is, is also active. So there's actually, there's, well, there's three wells that all belong to TP Bible Camp. Um, only two of them are active. One of them, it turns out, is actually a deep well and the other is a shallow well. And I believe that is um, the well that's the, the southernmost well in, in that cluster of three. So turns out it's about, it's an active well. It's about 2,200 feet from the um, edge of the uh, proposed location. And so what requirements would apply to that location? Um, they are within the, the buffer zone. So pitless drilling would apply. Um, the operator would need to have a formal consultation with the public water uh, system supplier, which is TP Bible Camp. And they would, in that consultation, discuss best management practices, um, what they're doing on the site to ensure that they are protecting the groundwater resource. Um, they would discuss whether or not groundwater monitoring is appropriate between the oil and gas location and that uh, public water system well. And they would discuss whether or not there are recharge areas for that well that also need to be protected. Um, and then, you know, it, on that location and for operations on the oil and gas location, uh, spill response and emergency notification um, would be required. So um, they would need to uh, have an emergency response plan. And if they have a spill, notify um, that PWS intake um, of the spill. Um, so that's all I have. Next slide, please, Hannah. Um, I just, I, I do want to take feedback and questions, um, and I may not be able to answer all the questions um, because some of them I may need to take back to CDPHE and Division of Water Resources. Um, but um, I, I did put up these three pictures um, of the Piance Basin, San Juan Basin, and DJ Basin to kind of show um, the extent of those um, uh, Goody and type three PWS wells within those basins. You can see they track, um, you know, obviously the stream channels, generally speaking. Um, so they're also along some of the major highways, which are also constructed, you know, near some of those uh, stream channels. Um, in the DJ Basin, you can see they follow up the South Platte um, you know, from Brighton up north to Fort Lupton. Um, in the Peons Basin there, the cluster on the right-hand side is um, there uh, upstream from Glenwood Springs and towards <clears throat> Carbondale and Aspen. And then in the San Juan Basin, again, they're, they're following some of the major uh, river channels in, in that area as well. 
Um, so I see, it looks like we've got a couple of questions chatted in already. Um, hey, hey, Greg, I've got my volume, my, um, my mic back if you want oh, me to read the questions out. Sorry about that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> no, no worries at all, Aunt Hannah. We totally appreciate your help. Thanks for covering for me. Um, so I, do you want me to just start reading? Sure. Awesome. Um, will 317B be renamed to 411 or something else once the buffers are field verified or at least some other time? Sorry, or at and, some other time. Yeah, and I will answer that to say yes, we will ultimately rename these layers. Um, for the time being, I just wanted to, you know, we wanted to make sure that the layers are there and that you all know that you can use them as named right now. Um, they are the best available data that we have. Um, and so uh, ultimately we will um, update them and, and finalize and, and rename them. Great, thank you. The next question is, why on the COGCC map layer does the water resource tab not have the new rule layers on it? It is like it's intermittent work Sometimes works sometimes and sometimes it isn't there. So it depends on the zoom where you are. So if you zoom in, those layers show up. They they aren't available at the statewide zoom. Um, and I don't know for sure the uh, you know exact one to one hundred thousand or one to six hundred thousand or or where they where they show up. But um, you do have to zoom in to to catch them. Great, that makes sense to me. Um, let us know if that doesn't make sense and we can kind of demonstrate it. So, you know, with respect to um, those Goody layers, I'm, I, you know, the three, 317B layers are, are pretty, thanks uh, Phyllis. Um, I'm, the 317B layers you know, I, I assume you're all pretty familiar with because we've been working with those since, um, you know, 2009. So the surface water protection program, I think, really hasn't hasn't changed. Um, you know, so I'm I am interested in feedback on how you uh, how operators are sort of integrating the Goody and Type Three wells into their planning. And um, you know, again, what we can do to to make that a a better and more workable um, you know map solution from from ours um, uh, from our perspective. All right, we have another question. Um, so, was tributary water affected by SB nineteen dash one eighty one? The tributary wells come under the w the DWR. Yeah, and I don't believe any any changes were made in our mission change rulemaking um, that that would have affected that. Um, I can certainly take that back to DWR and and find out more information about that. Thank you. I do have um, one other change of subject announcement. Um, if we're not getting more questions and thoughts on this, um, so and anyone's welcome to certainly contact me outside of this meeting on on 411. Um, and Justin, before we get to your question, I will carry on with this announcement. So the um, Rule 303 E2 information sheets um, have been finalized and posted on the mission change. Um, guidance document uh, list, the, although they're not guidance documents, we figured we'd put them um, there uh, along with everything else. Um, so those are, um, are now available uh, for you guys to send out to both local governments and the public upon receiving your completeness determination. Um, and I put you on the spot there, Hannah, I didn't actually um, confirm that oh, okay. they are uh, <laughs> posted. So there. Um, I saw Scott's fingers flying furiously. So um, they'll be sure. there soon. <laughs> I, th I think they will be there soon. Uh, 
Uh, the, elect the electrons are in transit. Excellent. All right, uh, next question is, since rule 411 refers to stream miles upstream, are there any plans to add flow direction to COGIS map data? Uh, no, the, you know, obviously the topo maps are already there. Um, so you can turn on the topo layers and determine your upstream downstream. Um, you can also look at the dendritic shape of the, um, uh, of the stream channel and determine which way the streams are coming together. Um, so I think sufficient information is there. I did receive a question, um, I believe on the uh, Q and A portal about how to measure those stream miles when you're talking about the 15 mile upstream spill notification, and uh, you know we're not looking for surveyed um, data on that. You know you can use GIS tools, you can use um, Google Earth, and you know do click a, a line, a polygon line, or a polyline along the um, along the stream path roughly and determine whether or not you're within that 15 miles. If you kind of do that exercise and you find that you're 15.02 miles, you might err on the side of caution and assume that you're, you know, the inaccuracy there actually puts you within that 15 miles, so. Thank you, Greg. Um, I have another question that came to me privately so you guys can't see it, uh, but it says, Will the updated 411 layer show the full 15 mile extent of the protected area? No, that will, that will just be, um, you know, again, up to the operator to make that determination and notify appropriately downstream. All right, thank you. Let's see if any other questions come in. So I appreciate everybody's participation today. You know, as Hannah mentioned at the outset of the uh, training, we are going to move these to bi-weekly. Uh, as you can appreciate, there's a, a lot of commitment on both your part and ours to uh, host these sessions. And we're trying to make sure we try to find the right velocity uh, for these sessions. Uh, we think we're at the at the place where a cadence of bi-weekly makes uh, more sense. And we'll, we'll do that for a number of uh, sessions and then uh, we'll likely transition back to our monthly cadence that we've historically maintained sometime in the summer ish or maybe a little before. If, um, you know, if there's concerns about that, email me. I'm happy to hear uh, what your concerns might be. Um, but, you know, our, our assessment of the cadence of the material is such that we think that's probably the best use of everybody's time. Um, Hannah, I don't know if we've got any more questions, but uh, I know we've all got plenty to do. So thanks very much for your participation today. Um, no, we don't have any other questions. So yeah, um, the next operator meeting will be Tuesday, March 23rd. I'll send that out the Friday before, if not prior to that. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and hope you have a great day. Thanks, Hannah, for managing us. <laughs> thanks. thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hannah. Why is it not doing? <laughs> I'm dying here. Okay, maybe that'll help.